Okay, tonight we're going to have a look at two beasts and it's called two allies and the beast and its image. And these beasts, of course, we find in Revelation chapter 13. Now, Revelation chapter 13 is the heart of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is written as a chiasm and a chiasm is a particular structure so the first half is a historic half. The last portion is the eschatological portion pertaining to all the events of the future and eventually culminating in the new earth and the new Jerusalem and a world without sin. And it's written, the first half, in a forward fashion progressively and the second half in a reverse fashion. So it's very confusing if you read it and you don't know the chiastic structure. Your mind starts doing this because the events seem to be the wrong way around. But when you take the chiasm into account, then you find out that the structure wants to tell us something. And the culmination of the structure is right there in the middle of Revelation chapter 13, 14, and almost to 17. And that means that Revelation chapter 13 is the heart of the final events on this planet. So it's a very, very important chapter. And the reformers had a great deal to say about Revelation chapter 13. Now when did you have a good sermon about Revelation 13 last? Nobody has it anymore, right? Now remember we did a lecture on, on Daniel chapter 7 and I'm sure some people's hair went slightly up and thought, ooh, can't say things like that. That's a bit rough because that's the normal feeling that one would have. But I want to tell you a little bit of history. John Knox, John Knox, the Protestant reformer, he was one of those that was banned and he was with Calvin in uh, Switzerland. And when he came home to his native Scotland, he of course had major confrontations with the Queen of the Scots, which could have cost him his head. And the very first sermon that John Knox preached when he came back to Scotland was Daniel chapter 7. And guess what the result was? The whole of Scotland became Protestant. One sermon. One sermon. So don't underestimate the power of prophecy in the Bible. And you know that the Scots and the English were at loggerheads for many, many years. And when they make movies like Braveheart, who saw that stuff? Some hands saw it. The, the truth is not really told in those, in those movies because those were religious wars. Because the, the England had taken... I'm, I'm way off the topic. I don't know why, but <laughs> let's, let's keep it like just for a short while. England had replaced the Pope with a king or the queen. And so the head of the church was now the king or the queen, whoever was ruling. Not the Scots. The Scots said, hold it, we have no king other than Jesus. When it comes to our religion, he's our king. He's not the, the king or the queen of Scotland. They are not the head of the church because there can only be one head of the church. And that is Christ. And that's what the wars were about. That's what the wars were about. England said, no, 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 you will, acknowledge, you will acknowledge the royalty. And the Scots went to war. The Scots went to war. Fascinating history. All right, two allies. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast. 
Now, Daniel already defined the beast for us. A beast is a kingdom. Rise up out of the sea. Revelation tells us what the what this means. The waters you saw are peoples, nations, multitudes, and kings. So we can interpret it as we saw a political entity rise up amongst the nations. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. So if there were crowns upon the rule on the on the horns, it was ruling. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now where did we have that word blasphemy in Daniel chapter seven? On which component? The little horn was a blasphemous power. Do you remember that? And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, who in Revelation chapter 12 is identified as the devil, gave him his power, and his seat, he sitteth. He has a seat and great authority. Now, who is this beast? And what does it refer to? So, I always like to refer people back to the reformers. What did they believe? What did they believe? And they were prepared to die for it. And they did, in their millions, at the stake, because they said it. Wesley comments, the beast is the Romish papacy. As it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer, to this and no other power on earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point. As we may see with the utmost evidence from the propositions following. The beast is a spiritually secular power. He then just points out the details, which we will be doing as well. The beast is a spiritually secular power opposite to the kingdom of Christ. A power not merely spiritual or ecclesiastical, not merely secular or political, but a mixture of both. The beast has a strict connection with the city of Rome. That was the reformed position. That is the position that the Lutherans had. That's the position that the Methodists has, because Wesley is their church father. This is the position that all the Reformed churches had, except their protege today. <laughs> now, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, take note how it is spelt. It's not with an A, it's with an O. Wondered after the beast. So it's a mindset. When you wonder about something, you're thinking about something. Isn't that right? So in other words, this beast induced a mindset in humanity that made humanity follow it. That's what it did. It induced a mindset. Now, how do we know who this beast is and uh, what are its attributes? The sad point is, verse 4 says, that when you do that, when you follow this beast and its mindset, then they actually worship the dragon, who is the devil which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. Because if you obey someone, the Bible says, then you have chosen him as your master. So if you follow him, you are worshiping the system, and in actual fact, behind the scenes, you are paying homage to the devil. So this is a very serious issue. Who is like unto the beast? Who can make war with him? So you can't make war with him because you will lose. And there are many, many nations that have tried to make war with him and they've all lost. 
And even Catholic nations, even Catholic nations have done the same thing. If you take all the Catholic nations of Europe, all of them banned the Jesuits. All of them. The Portuguese banned them, the Spanish banned them, the French banned them. All of them banned them. All the Catholic nations. And guess what? Each of them had revolutions and tumult and bloodshed until they were bludgeoned back into submission and the kings bow down and pay homage. We saw it yesterday in the picture. You cannot make war with him. He has the military might on its side. So the war is not carnal that the Bible is talking about here. The war is spiritual. It's a battle for the mind. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7. There was a blasphemous power and there was a time allocated to it. Remember? Time, times and the dividing of times. Or, as we would put it modernly, three and a half prophetic years, and the reformers used to say what? Those are day years. That was the reformed position. So they said it's 1,260 years, because three and a half times 360 makes 1,260, and that was the, the Hebrew... Yeah, so 1,260. Now it's given in months. Now, you can take the Bible and you can read it and you will find this repeated many, many times in what we call parallelism. So it will say, for example, a woman, a wilderness, da-da-da-da, time. And then a woman, a wilderness, da-da-da, time. And the time will be given in three and a half years, 1,260 days, 42 months with the same par parallelism, so it always refers to the same time period. Now, the Hebrew month had 30 days. 42 times 30, 1,260, same period. So we're talking about the same beast. We're talking about the little horn, which grew up amongst the other nations and became stout and powerful. So it became a powerful political entity, and it ruled. Now, when did it rule? Where were the crowns? On the ten horns. Who had ten horns in Daniel chapter 7? Which beast? The fourth one, Rome. So this must be what kind of a power? If the horns have the ten horns have the crowns, it must be a Roman power. Now, the beast has seven heads, and it has a conglomerate body. It has the mouth of a lion. It has the body of a leopard. It has the feet of a bear. It has how many horns? Ten. Where did you find all those features? In Daniel. Now do you understand why Martin Luther said, I have to translate this book, Daniel, first. Because it is the key to the book of Revelation. Now this beast had seven heads. How many heads were there in total in Daniel chapter 7? Let's just do a little bit of memory testing. The first beast, was the lion with eagle wings. How many heads did he have? One. The second beast was the bear, raised up on one of its sides. How many heads did it have? One. The third beast was the leopard beast. How many heads did it have? No. No. Four. That brings us to six. The last beast was a terrible beast. How many heads did it have? One. But it had ten horns on that head. So there were how many heads? Seven heads. Seven heads. And ten horns. How many heads and 
horns does this beast have? Seven heads and ten horns. So this beast is a conglomerate beast of all the beasts of Daniel chapter 7. Are you with me? So when I analyze the beast and I want to know who the beast is, then I have to look at the finer details. So now I'm getting a few more details. This beast is a blasphemous beast. Where do I find blasphemy in Daniel chapter 7? On which particular, if you want to hone in on it, on which particular political entity? The little horn power. He was the blasphemous one. So this one is blasphemous. Which beast in, or which political entity in Daniel chapter 7 had a time prophecy attached to it? The little horn power. What was the time prophecy? Three and a half years, 1,260 days. This one has a time prophecy given in months, 42 times 30, because that was the Hebrew month. We're using the same system as for Daniel. Same time prophecy, 1,260. So who is he? He must be the Roman papacy. There's no other explanation. That's what Wesley says. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So there are three things that he blasphemes. He blasphemes the name of God. He blasphemes the tabernacle of God and he blasphemes them that dwell in heaven. Well, let's start from the back. Who dwells in heaven? God and the angelic host. So Jesus Christ and the angelic host, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, that's what's in heaven. They're being blasphemed. The tabernacle is being blasphemed. The tabernacle was the earthly sanctuary, and the earthly sanctuary was a model or a, a, mini, a mini enactment, if you like, of the plan of salvation. Because there was an outer court of white linen, one door. Then there was the holy place and the most holy place. And all of this depicts the plan of salvation. The Bible tells us white linen is righteousness. So there was one door. Jesus says, I am the, the door. So you come in to the door who is Christ and you're surrounded by his righteousness. You're surrounded by his white linen, the righteousness. And the first thing you saw was the altar of burnt offering where a lamb was sacrificed. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It stands for the cross. Then there was the laver where you washed. It stands for the washing of rebirth. Then there was the holy place where there was the candlestick. In Revelation we hear that Jesus walks amongst the candlesticks and the candlesticks is the light of the world through the churches, through all ages. Then there was the altar of incense. Jesus making your prayers acceptable as a mediate, as your mediator. Then there was the table of showbreads with the bread on it, unleavened, representing the body of Christ. It was sacrificed for you and was without sin. But you have to internalize it. You have to internalize the character of Christ. And then there was the most holy place with the law in the Ark of the Covenant and the covering cherubs and the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was just as high as the grid of the altar of offering. So God's justice and God's mercy are equally high. So there's the plan of salvation. The mercy seat was solid gold. It shielded you from the condemnation of the law, which was inside the Ark of the Covenant, so that it should not condemn you to death. Christ took the penalty upon himself. And... Inside was the rod that Aaron had that blossomed. It stood for the Messiah and the pot of manna that would never deteriorate. That represented the body that Christ gave for our salvation. There's the plan of salvation. So if he blasphemes the tabernacle, then what's he doing? 
he's messing with the plan of salvation. Does Rome mess with the plan of salvation? Does it teach that you are saved by coming in through Christ into his righteousness, or do you enter his righteousness through another channel, which is the church? And the mediation, is the mediation directly via Christ, or is it via saints and Mary, and via the intercession of the church? So we could go through the whole process, and we could see that there's a serious problem. The Mass is a perpetual repetition of the exact same offering that took place on the cross. That negates the altar of offering where the Lamb of God was sacrificed once and for all. The entire plan of salvation is blasphemed. So he blasphemes his tabernacle. What about the name? What's the name stand for? Name is character. Name is character. You know, in English, if somebody messes with your name, you take him to court for defamation of character. If you want to do the same thing, but you're Afrikaans, what do you call it? Namskendung. It's the same thing. You don't mess with someone's name, his good name. You're messing with his character. And when we looked at the law and we looked at the character of God, we saw they were one and the same. So, what does he blaspheme? He blasphemes the law of God. He blasphemes the way of salvation. And therefore, he blasphemes those that are in heaven. This is a serious allegation. Serious. Blasphemy who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2.4, we discussed this verse in some detail. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Is that blaspheming those that are in heaven? All the names which in Scripture are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. Excuse me, that would make the Pope a mediator, is that correct? This is a serious, serious statement here. This is blaspheming those that are in heaven. Infallibility, this is South Africa own Bonaventure Henwood, he was the spokesman in the past for the church, and he says that the, St. Peter gets a particular assistance which guarantees freedom from error, and this is called infallibility. And it says thus, why Vatican I insisted that when the Pope exercises his supreme teaching authority, he is protected from error by that same infallibility which Christ willed for his church. It's interesting that they declared the Vulgate Bible infallible. And then an ex-pope had more than 1,000 corrections introduced into the Vulgate. And I'm sure that most of those corrections just compounded the errors. So much for papal infallibility. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Now remember, he's a beast. And a beast addresses which aspect? The political or the ecclesiastical? The political, because a beast is a kingdom. A woman is a church. All right. 42 months, as we have said, 1,260 years, because the Hebrew month had 30 days, times 42, 1,260. Ezekiel 4, verse 6, I've given you a day for a year. So those are year days. That's what the Reformers taught, all of them. Now let's look at the history. We've already mentioned it once before, but just make sure. Viglius ascended the papal chair, 538 A.D., at the fall of the Ostrogoths, 
under the military protection of Belisarius, this comes from history of the Christian church, so we have a starting date when he starts exercising political power. Prior to this, he only had ecclesiastical authority as head of the church. But now, he sits on the throne and he actually took the title of the emperor Pontifex Maximus, which was the title that all the Caesars had. So if you go to Rome and you look at the statues of the Caesars with their various names, they have the letters PM behind them, Pontifex Maximus. Then you go and look at the papal statues, they also have the letter PM. So he is elevating himself politically. And that started in 538 AD. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when there went into effect a decree of the Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. It was very fortuitous that Rome had translocated its rulership to Constantinople. And so Rome was a vacuum, which the Pope then filled. So if you add 1,260 years, you get to 1798. The Bible says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So there's a death somewhere in this beast. When does it take place? Revelation 13, verse 3. 1798, Bertia, the French general under Napoleon, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government. Now, if there is no more political power, it's abolished, then the beast is dead and established a secular one. That's the Encyclopedia Americana 1941 edition. So, between 538 and 1798, exactly 1,260 years. But then it also tells us that the deadly wound would be healed so that he would get his power back. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Which power in Daniel persecuted the saints? Wore out the saints. The little horn power. So this is the same power. You see all the parallels? If it's the same attributes as you had in Daniel, it must be the same power. And to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Would that include South Africa? All is pretty inclusive, would you agree? Did he persecute the saints? Well, look at the history. Inquisition. What does heresy mean? They were persecuted for heresy. Heresis, choice, deciding for oneself what one shall believe and practice. That's what you were killed for. He will decide for you, not you. All right. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, adopted his mindset. Now, this is the San Francisco Chronicle, from 1929, Mussolini and Gaspari, that's the papal representative, sign historic pact, and it says, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So the first step in making him a beast, again, is to give him political entity. So in 1929, the Vatican State was created, and he again became a beast. Was the wound totally healed immediately, yes or no? No, no wound heals immediately, it's a process. And the wound is still healing, because there were rifts, the... Protestants had left the Roman Catholic fold. The East Bloc churches had separated from Rome. That's a rift of more than a thousand years. And Pope Francis is working very hard to bring that rift to a close. And so he had a meeting just recently with Bartholomew, 
who is the patriarch of the Eastern churches, and they closed the rift, and they hugged and kissed on the stage. And the Protestants, sadly, have decided that they will also close the rift. But that we will discuss later. So yes, the wound was healing. And power was given him over all kindred, tongues, and nations. Now, that is a very powerful statement. All kindred, tongues, and nations. That's every single tribe and language group and nation on the entire planet. Would that include the Jews? Yes. And would it include... Black people, black nations, white nations, yellow nations, red nations, all is pretty inclusive. That's the whole world. So you're either with him or you're not with him. That's the choice you have. Now, let's look at some of the healing factors. The funeral of Pope John Paul II was the first funeral that was ever publicized and broadcast internationally. Today the technology is even better, but this was the first mega publicized funeral. And the BBC announced that the Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared the way for a religious new world order. So this is the healing of the wound process. And the Protestant representative of the world, Billy Graham, said that the Pope was the moral leader of the world. Which should shock anyone's boots off. And if you were anyone at that time, when Pope John Paul II died, you would have to drop whatever you were doing and you had to go to that funeral. At that stage, it was Margaret Thatcher that was still ruling in England. She had to don the black robes and go, as well as Helmut Kohl over there. And Bonnie Prince Charlie had to postpone his wedding day. So it must be pretty important. And the presidents of the United States came and bowed down. If you were of any stature in the world, you had to go. And Newsweek wrote, under John Paul II, who helped bring down the Iron Curtain, the Holy See gained more political clout than it had enjoyed since the Renaissance. So this beast was gaining in political stature. By the way, who was supposed to have mediated in the fall of the divide between East and West, which was symbolized in the Berlin Wall? Who brought down the Iron Curtain? It's claimed that John Paul II did it. Now, who mediated the rift closure between Cuba and the United States, Pope Francis. So don't underestimate the political clout that is involved over here. And if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. So there's the description of the first beast up until the point where he was killed with the sword and died a death. We know that he would have a resurrection. By the way, the word antichrist means in the place of Jesus Christ. It also means against Jesus Christ, but in the most common usage, it means in the place of. So when he calls himself Vicarius Filii Dei, which means Vicar of the Son of God, then he is saying, I am in the place of Jesus Christ, which actually means Antichrist. And uh, he was killed with the sword. Jesus had a death and a resurrection. Here is a counterfeit death and resurrection. Just one last, last few points. This beast has the mouth of the lion. Now the lion stands for Babylon. And if you go into the teachings of Rome and its religious structure, 
especially the aspect of mother and child worship. That's Babylonian. It comes from Babylon. It comes from Nimrod and Semiramis. Now, the other component was the feet of a bear. That was Persia. Now, what does Rome have that was Persian? Mitraism. The entire Roman Catholic system, its structure is based on Mitraics. So it's Persian structure, Persian religious structure. Very successful. And all the top, top leaders in Rome itself, including the Caesars, were Mitraics. They were followers of Mitra. Then it had the body of a leopard. So the bulk of it was leopard. And the leopard stood for which nation? Greece. So the philosophy that is embodied in the Roman Catholic structure is a Greek philosophy. Its entire political and legal system is influenced by Greek philosophy. Yesterday we spoke about natural law. Remember that? It's a Greek philosophy. So it has Greek philosophy. And then its legal system is Roman. So this is a conglomerate beast that has absorbed the best from Babylon down to Roman times and has incorporated it into its structure. Now, it received a mortal wound, the sword, it must be killed. So if you persecute, you yourself will suffer the consequences. When was it killed with a sword? Give me a date. 1798. So this verse here, 9 and 10, if you want to add a date to it, you would have to write over it 1798. Because that's when he received a mortal wound. And the prophet sees it, receiving the mortal wound, and the year is 1798. And he looks round, and the very next verse says, and I saw another beast. What is that? It's another political entity. Coming up out of the earth. So the previous one came up amongst the nations. The C stands for peoples, nations, multitudes, kings. Just look at the Revelation, gives you that definition. This one comes out of the earth. So it doesn't arise where there are nations. So it must be in a new territory. And it had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. So he has lamb principles. Lamb? What kind of religion would it have? If it has lamb principles. It must be a Christian nation. So here's another nation arising. We have a date. He sees the first one going down, 1798. He sees the second one coming up. And he says, this one is not amongst the nations. It's somewhere else. It's Christian, but it also speaks like a dragon. What nation could that possibly be? Let's go back to the Reformers. What did they think? Now remember, the Reformers lived prior to this nation actually becoming a nation. This is phenomenal. Wesley wrote in his notes on Revelation 13, they were written in 1754. He says, of the two-horned beast, he is not yet come. Though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. These people were sharp, eh? These people were sharp. Unbelievable. What nation would arise in an area where there were no political, territorial organizations and structures and kingdoms that would be a Christian nation with lamb-like principles that eventually could become so powerful as to dictate even to the world? There's only one that qualifies. So let's have a look at it. The rise of the United States. 1776, the Declaration of Independence. You're not a nation yet. 
1783, the most of the world acknowledges the Declaration, except the superpower of Europe, which was France at the time. They didn't acknowledge it yet. 1787, a constitution was framed. You're not really a beast if you don't have a constitution, a territory, and a ruler. 1791, the Bill of Rights was added. 1798, bang on target, recognition by France. Now here's an irony. Which beast gave the first beast its mortal wound? France. France. And France recognizes the independence of the second beast, bang, on target in the same year. Very interesting. 1863, Slave Emancipation Act, lamb-like lamb -like principle, because Jesus also came to set the captives free. He spoke like a dragon. Now that's scary. How does a dragon speak? Well, if you want to know how the dragon speaks, you just uh, ask the first beast to please open its mouth. Because the Bible says the dragon gave him his what? His seat, his power, his authority, and he must have reflected the mindset of the dragon. So let's ask the first beast to tell us how a dragon speaks. This is the syllabus of Pope Pius IX, and he says the state has not the right to leave every man free to embrace whatever religion he shall deem true. The church has the right to require that the Catholic religion shall be the religion of the state to the exclusion of all others, and cursed be those who assert liberty of conscience and of worship, and such that maintain that the church may not employ force. Ooh, sounds like a dragon. Now I want you to think about that, because the second beast that is lamb-like speaks like a, a dragon. This is dragon language. Could, could the United States actually become prescriptive in terms of your religious viewpoints? Is there such a possibility? Here's another one, La Sofilta Catolica. By the way, that's the official Jesuit publication. The Roman Catholic Church must demand the right to freedom for herself alone. The Roman Catholic is to wield his vote for the purpose of securing Catholic ascendancy in this country, talking about the state. There you have some examples of dragon language. And it, the second beast, exercises all the authority of the feast first beast before him. That's also scary. The first beast was very prescriptive. Everybody had to bow down. If you didn't, you were punished as a heretic. You were put to death. Now this beast will exercise, the second one, all the authority of the first beast before him and cause the earth and those dwelling in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13, 12. In other words, the second beast will enforce the mindset of the first beast, which is Rome, on everybody. You're either with us or you're not with us. You're either with us in this or you're a terrorist, you're gone. Who actually said that in so many words? George Bush said it. George Bush said it. You're either with us, or you're dead. Choose. All right, so the second beast will enforce the mindset and the norms and the rules of the first beast. And it does great wonders, so that it makes fire come down from heaven onto the earth in the sight of men, and it deceives those dwelling on the earth because of the miracles which were given to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth that they should make an image to the beast who had the wound by the sword and lived. Now that's a whole 50,000 ser sermons in one verse. Some people say, all right, the United States, it's a highly powerful military power, fire from heaven, that must be bombs and atomic bombs and all of that. No, 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 no. 
It cannot be that. Nobody will ever be deceived by an atomic bomb. You'll just be blown to smithereens. <laughs> Do you agree with me? All right, so this must be a symbol. It makes fire come down from heaven onto the earth and it deceives. So this fire from, from where? From heaven deceives people. And how is this deception enforced? By miracles. Miracles. What kind of religion emanates from the United States of America if you switch on your television? And when you watch their mega evangelists come to this country and draw stadiums full of people, don't you have miracles and healing services and all of these things and driving out demons and people miraculously supposedly being healed and give me a thousand dollars and you will be a multimillionaire in ten minutes? And people are so silly, they give the man the money. <laughs> Isn't this the kind of religion that is being sold to the world today? An experiential experience with God that is poured out upon people irrespective of whether they are followers of God or not. This is a deception. Now what is fire from heaven? We'll come to that in a second. And then it is a situation where they must make an image to the first piece. Now what's an image? An image is something that looks like the original. So when I stand in front of a mirror, what do I see of myself? I see an image. All right, what was the first piece like? So if I want to make an image, what must the second one be like? The first one was a politico-religious system combined, which enforced its view upon the populace. Church and state working in harmony to enforce the mindset and the doctrines. That was the operation structure of the first beast. So when somebody was accused of heresy, the church accused him of heresy and handed him over to whom? To the state. The church never killed anyone. The church handed him over to the state, and the state executed the person. They would torture, yes, they would do all of those things to get an acknowledgement of heresy, but once that sentence was passed, the state did the rest. So here we're going to have a system that is built on the same principles as the first one, and that will be an image. Now isn't it fascinating that church and state are separated in the United States by the Constitution. That's a lamb-like principle. Render unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar, and unto God what is due unto God. That's lamb-like principle. Jesus said that, didn't he? But not these people. They say, uh -uh, uh uh we're going to combine the two. And that limits freedom of conscience. Then you are no longer free to choose, because then your conscience is legislated. Now let's get through with this. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. So this is not just some ordinary power. He's got some clout. So he'll have what kind of clout? Political clout, military clout, economic clout. Why do you think the dollar is so strong again? And why do you think that the oil price is just tumbling like crazy? So that every single nation will be subject to that power. Because the United States has more oil than any of the other nations all put together. All put together. Most of the oil wells are capped, but the new technology makes it capable, makes it just unbelievable the amount of oil that they have. And cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now you can only worship the image of the beast if you believe that this is the right thing to do, and you follow cognitively. Now what's just, by the way, interesting, is Ciao Americana, it's an Italian magazine in the United States, an independent news magazine for Italian Americans. 
Sister cities in 2011, Washington, D.C., and Rome signed the Concordat and they became sister cities. It's interesting also that the architecture of the two cities is very similar, but it was noted that perhaps the similarities were not accidental but deliberate. So the detail is just so amazing, not just in political structure, but actually physically the one is an image of the other. Isn't that interesting? So if you look at the architecture, the Capitol is schooled on the Vatican. It's the same architectural style. So the union of church and state would bring about an image. Now in the United States, you have this euphoria or this, this supposed democratic system where you have the Democrats and you have the Republicans as the main two opposing parties. I have news for you, they both sit at the feet of the Knight of Malta and get their marching orders from there. So whether you are the president or whether you are the candidate for the other party, you sit at the same table. You sit at the same table. And did you know that every single president that the United States has ever had came from exactly the same family? And did you know that they're all royals? They're all royals. And so, McCain, for example, who opposed Obama in the previous election, is the tenth cousin of Obama through his mother's side. Every single one of the presidents is related. They come from one family, the Howard family, which is royal. That is just a tad more than incidental, don't you think? If you're interested in this sort of thing, I have a lecture out where I look at all the political structures and how they came into existence politically and historically. It's called the Beamable Sustainable Princes. You might want to look at that one. So this is George Bush's cousin as well. It's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd and to say, what do we have to do to come home? Robert Schuller was the first one who set that in motion. Now, Robert Schuller had two students, and he was a 33-degree Freemason, Robert Schuller, and his two students, his two top students, were Bill Hybels of the Willow Creek Movement, which spreads its religion across the entire world, and anybody who's who's who in the zoo in terms of religion either went to study with them or someone affiliated with them. And the other one is Rick Warren. Now, this is the Ark community. And this was when Tony Palmer, yeah, when he was still alive before his tragic motorcycle accident, and he was a Protestant, Pentecostal, made the appeal for all evangelicals to reunite with Catholicism. The wound has to heal in its totality. She will not suffer loss of children. And so, under the leadership of Kenneth Copeland and the leaders of the evangelical movement, they all came together in 2014 to speak about reuniting with Rome. This is what Rick Warren had to say. The first Reformation was about belief. This one's going to be about behavior, said Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California and author of the best-selling The Purpose Driven Life. He's the most influential religious leader in the United States at the, at the moment. He's the one who did the prayer at the inauguration of President Obama. So... This is big stuff. The first one was about creeds. In other words, belief systems, the first reformation. This one's going to be about deeds. And that should already send up a thousand warning lights. Because the Bible says, take heed of the doctrine that no one deceives you. So your creed is very important. What do you believe? Is it in harmony with the Bible? Because good deeds look good to the outside. And anybody who does a good deed, well, that looks honorable. But the Bible says, when you do your good deeds, do them how? 
Do them secretly so that your Father in heaven will honor you. But these deeds are done publicly, so you have all these orphanages and children to be taken care of and this and that and the other and uh, handing out you know, packages for poor people. These are all wonderful things. Nothing wrong. Every Christian should do it. But this is not your religion. This is a consequence of your religion. Now when I hand a package to someone who is poor, does it matter whether the hand that hands it out is Catholic, Protestant, Lutheran, Methodist, Buddhist, Muslim, or Satanist? Does it, does it make a difference? No, the one who receives is grateful. And it looks good to the outside. You don't know what's going on on the inside. So he says, the first one, that was based on creeds, divided the church. This time it will unify the church. So the unification will become apparent on deeds, not on doctrine. In fact, Tony Palmer said, the Lord will sort out the doctrine when we get upstairs. That's what he said. Excuse me, why did he bother to write it in a book so that we could sort it out downstairs? Mega church pastor Rick Warren joins Pope Francis in support of common mission. And this is December, this is last month. Pastor Rick Warren has called on non-Catholic Christians to join with Pope Francis and the Catholic Church in pursuit of their common goals. Here's another one. Rick Warren meets with Pope Francis. Warren is among 30 global religious leaders taking part at the Conference of the Vatican. He said, Up close, you can feel the humility and compassion the others see from afar. Is the wound between Protestantism and Catholicism healing, yes or no? Absolutely. And he performed great miraculous signs. This is the second beast even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. And because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, excuse me, did, did, did that gel in your head? How did he get this power? On behalf of the first beast. Now if we look into the history of the modern church structures, we will see that they all came out of Vatican II and that behind the scenes, Rome is incredibly involved. And uh, we can do, deal with that in a later lecture. And he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Now if we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 3, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the Bible says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So the fire that came down from heaven was a symbol of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here's another fire that comes down from heaven, but it performs miracles which deceive. Can it be the Holy Spirit or is it a counterfeit spirit? This is serious stuff. It was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. What did the first beast do when someone disagreed with him on a religious basis? Killed you. Killed you. Does the United States already recognize the need, in adverted commas, to kill those who religiously are not on a par with their thinking? Or do they already do it? Yes. Does it matter to them if there's collateral damage and innocent people die in the process? Uh, we're getting pretty close, right? Now, if you go back to Daniel, 
there you have the three uh, friends of Daniel, and they were forced by Nebuchadnezzar to bow down to an image of solid gold because Nebuchadnezzar defied the God of heaven. The God of heaven said to him, your kingdom will be replaced. Your gold kingdom will be replaced by an inferior one of silver and that by an inferior one of bronze and that by an inferior one of iron and that by a division of, into iron and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no, won't happen. I defy you. My kingdom will stand until the end of time. Redo the image that God gave. Make it gold from top to bottom and worship it. Bow down to it and acknowledge its superiority. That's defying God. That's defying God's kingdom. Because when that final structure was destroyed, it was destroyed by a stone, not cut out by human hands, and it obliterated all those kingdoms, and the kingdom of God took its place. Here he is saying, won't happen. So the final power will do exactly the same thing. It will oppose God's kingdom and set up its own. Are you with me? And if you don't bound down to it, you get thrown into the fiery furnace. What happened to these three when they were thrown into the fiery furnace? The ropes burnt away instantly, but nothing, not even a hair, was singed. In fact, there was not a smell of smoke upon them. And that is the promise for the last generation. When that image is set up, which defies the kingdom of God, God's people will go through a terrible time, which the Bible calls a time of tribulation. They will end up in the fiery furnace, but nothing will happen to them because the fourth man in the fire is Jesus Christ himself. So there are beautiful promises here in the Bible. Now, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the number of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a computer that stands in Brussels. No, neither is it a number on a barcode. Isn't that the theology of the day? You will receive a barcode so that you cannot buy or sell? Well, I have news for you. It doesn't say that in the Bible. That's a new theology. It is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. So we have to ask, what is the mark? The mark of the beast. What is his number? It is the number of a man. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. What did the little horn have? It had eyes like a man. So we always have to link back to Daniel chapter 7. Let's ask the Jesuits. Our Sunday visitor is a Jesuit magazine. They should know because the present Pope is a Jesuit too. What are the letters inscribed on the Pope's crown and what do they signify, if anything? There are some people who say this is not authentic because it was only once there by mistake. Sorry, two years apart, twice in the same magazine, same Jesuits reaffirming the fact. They know what they're talking about. So what do these letters on the Pope's crown signify? The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Filii Dei, which is the Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God. And as I've already explained, literally it means in the place of Jesus Christ, so it means Antichrist. Vicarius Filii Dei, that's the number of his mitre, that's his name. It's the number of this Name, Vicarius Fili Dei. Now, each letter in the Latin has a numerical value, so calculate the number 
and add them together and see where you get. You get to 666. But it's also the number of the beast. Didn't it say so? It's the number of his name, Vicarius Filei Dei, in the place of Christ. But it's the number of the beast. Now if you take the Greek numerical values and you look at the titles given to the Roman church, it's called Helatina Basileia, which is the Latin kingdom, adds up to 666. By the way, an E with a stripe on it does not have the same numerical value in the Greek as one without. So don't let yourself be confused here. 666. The official title of the Church of Rome is Italia Ecclesia, which is the Italian church, 666. And the Latin-speaking man, the title of the man, the official title in Greek for the Pope, 666. That's pretty strange. So what is his mark? Well, you'll have to ask him. You're the beast. Please tell us what your mark is. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. This is blaspheming against the tabernacle. This is blaspheming against those that are in heaven. And the Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how can he change what Christ has said? He can't. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change, Sabbath to Sunday, was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. This is their own quote, official answer from Cardinal Gibbons. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. One source after the other. Roman Catholic Church protests it transferred the Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath to Saturday, Saturday to Sunday, and that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So they claim that the mark of their authority is that they transferred the Sabbath to Sunday. Now, why would they make that the mark of their authority? You see, when you look at the Sabbath, it says in the Bible, you must keep it because in six days he made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So it gives his title, he's the made, he's the creator, and it gives his jurisdiction, heaven and earth. If there's another power that takes over and changes that day, then who has the authority and the jurisdiction? The second power. So we're talking about two kingdoms. One, where there's one ruler who claims jurisdiction over heaven and earth, and one of another kingdom, and he puts a triple crown on his head because he says he's ruler of heaven earth, and netherworld. So he rules over everything. He's superior to the apostles. He's superior to the angels. And he can change the precepts of Christ. Who's the ruler then of the second kingdom? There are two kingdoms here. And we have to choose which one are we part of now. Which one are we part of? Now the United States is a lamb-like power where its constitution separates church and state, and where you have certain constitutional rights as a citizen. The government has no right to enforce its will upon you. The government's duty is to maintain law and order and to protect the country and to make sure that it runs properly. That's it. Battlefield. Americans face arrest as war criminals under army state law. In Luke it says, man's hearts will be failing them for fear in the last days as they look upon the things that are coming to this earth. This is Russian television. Senate approves indefinite detention and torture for Americans. 
The terrifying legislation that allows for Americans to be arrested, detained, indefinitely, tortured and interrogated without charge or trial passed through the Senate on Thursday with an overwhelming support from 93% of lawmakers. Question. Did the first beast torture people? Yes. Just read the poetry of the time. Fuse in fire. Feet in the fire. How they would torture people on the rack and uh, the most horrendous torture instruments. You can go and look at them in the museums overseas. The second beast has legislation which now permits it to torture people. Is it an image of the first beast? Okay. So they're going to arrest their own citizens and uh, detain them without trial indefinitely. Did Obama sign a martial law executive order? As folks headed out to happy hour last Friday evening, President Obama signed an executive order that could potentially give him the power to institute martial law in the United States, even in times of peace during a national threat. Verizon forced to hand over telephone data, full court ruling. Does the United States have an espionage system that reaches into your very home, yes or no? Can they tap your telephones? Yes. Through the echelon system, they can tap every single conversation that takes place on a cell phone on the entire earth and it picks up certain keyword code words that go into a computer which analyzes them and spits it out and there are thousands of people employed doing nothing else than listening. How high up do you have to be to be immune from this interference? Well, have you watched the news? Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, was her phone tapped by the United States, yes or no? Yes. When the German government complained, did the Americans apologize and stop the process, or did they say, it's our right to do this, keep quiet? What did they do? They said, it's our right, leave us alone, we'll see you right. <laughs> All right, okay, interesting. Now this is a, a, just a, a little bit of tongue-in-cheek stuff by the Huffington Post, but I thought they were quite clever when they did it. They took George W. Bush, who stands for the military, and they have Obama here listening in on the telephone conversations of everyone in the world, and then they fused the two facial faces and they did a brilliant job, isn't that? It looks like both of them. It's magnificent. And they called him George W. Obama. Now, Sunday, the Roman Catholic Church says, is the mark of its authority that it is the ruler of the kingdom. The Lord's Day Alliance. The Lord's Day Alliance in the United States exists to encourage Christians to reclaim the Sabbath, the Lord's Day, as the day of spiritual and personal renewal, enabling them to impact their communities with the gospel. In challenging economic times, like the world faced in 2009, when the whole world moved into a fascist regime, by the way, the Lord's Day Alliance is seeking to uncover scriptural truths regarding how the Ten Commandments, combined with Jesus' teachings about money. This is interesting. Because the mark of the beast will be implemented on what level? Religious or economic? How do we know? Because you will not be able to buy or sell. That's an economic measure. An economic measure. Can provide guidance for Christians in daily living. All right. Here is uh, an article they brought out in 2001 after September 11. And it says, at the same time, the national tragedy that occurred on September 11 in New York, in Washington and Pennsylvania, has changed our perspective and frankly has caused even those who lack a spiritual thermometer to consider their faith, many for the first time in their life. We stand on the verge of an unprecedented opportunity to proclaim the message of the Christian Sunday. Now, the first piece is the one that ruled, particularly on the continent. The second beast arose out of the earth, 
What's the first beast saying to this? By Benedict, the EU must keep Sunday, says the Catholic Church. Then Brussels, Belgium, February 16, 2009. This is an interesting story. The bishops of the Bishops' Conference of the European Community come together and they go to the EU government, the parliament, and they ask for a European Sunday law to be implemented in Europe. The parliament debates it and says, sorry, that was in 2009. We're not going to give you a Sunday law in Europe because you already have a day of rest in the Constitution, and whether that day of rest falls on a Sunday, a Monday, a Thursday, or a Saturday, or whatever, makes no difference as long as you have a day of rest. So they kick it out. Did it stop there? No. Court rules German shops must close on Sunday. That's December 23rd, 2009. So just a few months after the European government or parliament throws out the application, Germany decides we're going it alone. And they make a law. And the court's president, Judge Hans-Jürgen Papier, said economic impact alone did not warrant extra Sunday openings, so you will close the stores. If you open them on a Sunday, you will be fined millions of euro. If you go and pull out a blade of grass in your garden, we'll fine you instantly. If we find you anywhere, then doing that which is right and decent, you're in trouble. So Germany in Europe sets the precedent, makes a law in 2009. And the Spiegel Online, which is, you know, like CNN or Time magazine, says, even atheists need to switch off on Sundays. Germany's highest court has ruled that Sunday should be kept as a day of rest and has overturned the Berlin law easing restrictions on Sunday shopping. Now, this is interesting. Germany is such a secular state. You would think that they would say, whoa, who are you to legislate this kind of thing? But listen to what happened. Most German newspapers on Wednesday greet the ruling. Some for reasons of religion and tradition, others out of concern for workers' rights. So there's two reasons why people greet the ruling. The one is because of religious conviction, and the other one is because of workers' rights. Now, the forehead and the hand. Is that a literal stamp that you get there or a little chip that you get there to do your banking? Excuse me, does it make a big lot of difference whether you draw your money out of the ATM with a card or whether you hold your hand there or your forehead? Doesn't make any difference. It's just a barcode. Is God interested in how you draw your money? Surely not. Is God interested in how you think in terms of whose authority you acknowledge, yes or no? I certainly would think so. So if you think that it's good to have a Sunday law for reasons of conscience, where's your mark? It's in your forehead. And if you think it's good to have a day of rest from labor, where's your mark? on your hand. Now if you go back to the Old Testament, the law of God had to be on the forehead and the hand. Write it on your foreheads and on your hand. So the Jews just did that. They wrote out the law, stuck it on their forehead and carried it around on their hand. Do you think that's what God had in mind? I think he wanted them to Think accordingly and act accordingly. This power is satisfied if the mark is on your forehead or your hand. doesn't care if you're an atheist as long as you acknowledge its authority and obey. All right, let's look at this a little further. So the churches asked for Sunday law. They threw it out. So the labor unions joined the churches. And these are massive labor unions, with power and authority, just like Kusatu. If they want to lay a country lame, they can do it. 
So now it was not only the churches asking, but the labor unions. And the next step, Krisengipfel im Kanzleramt, das Sonntagsgegacker. Now what does that mean? With the financial crisis, there was a crisis meeting at the Chancellor's residence, in other words, Angela Merkel, and she got her top guides together to represent or to discuss issues that were to be dealt with in Parliament the next day, Monday. So on what day did they have their little private discussion? Sunday! And what happened when they did that on Sunday? Das Sonntagsgegacker, this Sunday cackling amongst you. What's this nonsense? And who was the one who said it? Reinhard Marx. Now who's he? Reinhard Marx is the Archbishop of Munich. So he's the chief representative of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany. In fact, Cardinal Ratzinger became Pope Benedict, had that post before he became uh, the Cardinal. And he said the following. I'll read it in German. Politiker sollten ein Zeichen setzen und sonntags keine Arbeitssitzungen abhalten, forderte der Oberhitte grollend die Sonntagsruhe ein. Politicians should set a sign, a mark. In German, it is mal Zeichen des Tieres. Mark of the beast is Zeichen in German. So he says they should set a mark and not have meetings on a Sunday. So asked the top shepherd furiously. That's what it says. Now here's Reinhard Marx. There's a picture of him wearing purple and he's hugging someone in red and I couldn't resist putting in this verse. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones. Just being naughty. Anyway, the discussion then proceeded and the churches, the labor unions, and then the civil organizations came to the European Parliament and said, excuse me, we want a Sunday law. And so they started introducing a Sunday law. Work-free Sunday, protection for a work-free Sunday. Churches, Civil societies, trade unions. Now there's clout. Now there's clout. Not just churches. Everybody's asking. Secular, non-secular. We want Sunday law. We want it now. The European Parliament, a fright, steps back and says, we want national consensus. Bring us a million signatures from the public and we'll consider it. So they put out a web page one million citizens needed to request day for children. Now, that's a new one. Day for children? How does that work? Sonntags gehören Mommy und Papi uns. Sundays, Daddy and Mommy belong to us. It's now Children's Day. The argument goes something like this. In Europe, there's a six-day working day, week. And the only day that the children are really free from schooling is which day? Sunday. Sunday. So now the churches argue, excuse me, Parliament, you say it doesn't matter which day you are off, whether it's a Wednesday or a Thursday or a Saturday or a Monday. It could be any day. Your argument is false because the children are free on Sunday. But if you are working on that day, because your free day is a Wednesday or a Thursday or any of the other days, what are your children doing at home? And how are they then at home? Aren't they alone? And isn't that why they are on the street? And isn't that why there's no family coherence? And isn't that why the world is so sick as it is? And isn't that where they get involved in drugs and sexual experiences and the destruction of society and norms? You, dear European Parliament, 
Are you not interested in norms and standards and family values? Ooh, powerful argument. Powerful argument. You think the European Parliament will capitulate? EU initiative for the free Sunday. So Radio Vatican says, we want you to, to support the initiative and we want it now. So they organize an organization called the European Sunday Alliance and it says it's for your health, it's for your family. We've got to live together in harmony. And they have another organization where they go out and they call it a thousand tables for Sunday. Are you still shopping or are you celebrating already? And this is their statement. July th the 3rd, in the year 321, 1,690 years ago, a decree went into effect by the Caesar Constantine that Sunday should be a day of rest. So on the 3rd of July, 2011, we, this organization, are putting out a thousand tables to ensure that this rest day will exist in future as well. So off they went into the shopping areas, put out tables, and as the people came out, they made them sign whether they agreed with Sunday legislation or not. Interesting. Vatican official exhorts Catholic to set Sunday for God's day of rest. It should be a day of worship, rest, and time with the family and friends. So the initiative is on. So Germany set the precedent on the continent where the territory of the first beast is. The second one is going to be a what? An image. North Dakota Catholic Conference says Sunday law benefits all people. So North Dakota, the state in the United States, makes Sunday law. So there's an example in Europe and there's an example in the United States. And so people start arguing against it. And they say, excuse me, that's unconstitutional. You may not make a Sunday law because church and state are supposed to be separate. So the Catholic society answers, the purpose of North Dakota's Sunday closing law is not to impose times of worship, nor is it to demand adherence to religious doctrine. The purpose of the law is to preserve the common good by ensuring that society is not overtaken by work and profit, wrote Christopher Dodson, executive director of the North Dakota Catholic Conference. It's an economic measure. It's an economic measure. But we want it. Sunday church going makes women happier than shopping, says the Catholic television news. You must please inform me whether that is true or not. <laughs> Then they begin an organization which they call 7A. They're confused with their numbers. It should be 1A, because Sunday is the first day of the week. Alliance for a Free Sunday. And they, they have little snazzy adverts like this. Without Sunday, something's missing. So you're only really complete if you have the Sunday. And here the politicians are seen signing on the dotted line that we want this legislation. Now, what about the Jews? They keep the Sabbath. This is a major problem. How are you going to get around, with, around this? And then this rift between the religious systems. So, fortunately, we have someone like Pope Benedict who decides to exonerate the Jews for the death of Jesus. So, Pope Benedict said, I exonerate all the Jews for the death of Jesus. They didn't kill him. It was the Roman sol soldiers that killed him. But the Bible clearly says that they killed him by handing him over to the Jews. And as a result, Prime Minister Netanyahu thanked the Pope for exonerating the Jews. And now we're going to move a little bit closer. Financial Express. Israel's government is examining a proposal to shift the weekend to the Western Saturday and Sunday, a step that might benefit financial markets. So Sunday is being brought in at the same time. Now, this was the debate before Obama's election. 
And I'm just showing you this to show how the mindset in the United States has changed. Because it's lamb-like, but it's going to speak like a what? Like a dragon. Now, one of the candidates that nearly, nearly made it as the Republican candidate was Rick Santoro. He came second to Mitt Romney. Second. And he made a number of speeches that were absolutely phenomenal. So that even the Los Angeles Times says, you know, this is our religious man and he's against same-sex marriage, abortion, the pill, atheist. This is the kind of person that we need. So they're mocking uh, the religious people in the United States. Now, Rick Santorum, uh, who, by the way, is an Opus Dei man as well, uh, just for interest's sake, made an interesting statement. Now, when Kennedy came to power, he made a very famous speech. And I believe it cost him his life. Because Kennedy, the first Catholic president of the United States, made the following speech. I don't know whether I get the words exactly right, but more or less as follows. I believe in an America where no Catholic Pope will tell the president of the United States how to rule his country. I believe in an America where no Protestant prelate will tell the voters how to vote. I believe in an America where church and state is separate. And Rick Santorum, who nearly became the candidate for the Republicans, with millions of followers and fans, said, that speech makes me one to throw up. He believes, in other words, in what? Church and state together. It'll speak like a dragon. Pope calls for a new world order. Obama seeks a new world order. What will that order be like? This was Obama's webpage. He didn't write it, but it was permitted on his personal webpage. It, this person wrote about the loss of Sunday, and he says, perhaps we should consider enacting a Sunday law not to restrict people from worshipping, but to give liberty to those who cannot choose. Catholic Church and trade unions form a holy alliance to enforce Sunday observance. So they start marching in the streets of Europe and in Italy, the trade unions. And then came the financial collapse in Europe and the rest of the world. And Greece suffered particularly. Now listen to this brilliant strategy. Eurozone demands six-day week for Greece. Greece, you are financially bankrupt. If you want to get bailout money, then you have to introduce a six-day work week. And there are certain rules regarding this six-day work week. So, the leaders of Greece went to the financial institutions. Eurozone demands six-day week for Greece. Terms for a second bailout might include labor market reforms from minimum wages to flexible working hours, etc., etc. Now, how are those working hours? Maximum weekly working time of employed persons cannot exceed more than 48 hours. You may not work more than 48 hours. It's your human right. On average, and at the most, a period of four months, including overtime. Rest period. Minimum rest time in any 24-hour period cannot be less than 12 continuous hours, and employees are entitled to a minimum continuous period of rest of at least 24 hours per week, including Sunday. Boom. Brilliant! You may not work more than 48 hours. Now, 48 hours, 8 hours, divided into 6, that gives you 6 working days. You cannot work more than that, it's illegal, so you cannot have overtime to make up for any other day. You must have a continuous 24-hour rest period, including Sunday, that leaves which day alone for rest? You can only rest on Sunday. It's the only one. And if the, if the government doesn't enforce this as law, it doesn't get bailout money. The country is bankrupt then. 
cannot exist. So the only way in which you would be able to avoid it, well, there is no way in which you could avoid it. You cannot go to your, to your boss and say, excuse me, I want to keep the seventh day because the Bible says, six days shall you labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. I want to rest on Sabbath. Can I work it in on Sunday? No, you can't because there's no time for you to work it in on Sunday. Can I work overtime on the other days to work in the hours? No, you can't, because the law forbids you. Can you make an exception in my case? We will lose the bailout money. The whole country will go bankrupt if we make an exception. The law is already there. If it's good for Greece, won't it be good for everyone else who needs money? Everybody who is tied into the International Monetary Fund is subject to this law. And if there is a country that has no debt and doesn't owe the International Monetary Fund a cent, well, well, maybe like Syria, we'll just flatten the country so that they will have need of making some debt to restore the country. And then we can enforce our law at any level we choose. This is no longer a possibility, it is already a current reality. Holy Alliance in Italy protests against working on Sunday. Pope Francis laments working on Sundays. The issue is absolutely paramount at the moment. Never on a Sunday, Pope Francis says, working on Sunday has negative effect on the family. So this is why they're having their family forums. This is why Rick Warren and all of them are coming together. And the solution to the family crisis, the drug crisis, in the whole world will be to reintroduce this day of rest. But it is the mark of the beast. And if you choose between the mark of the beast and the mark of God, which has to be on the forehead and the hand, then we come to an impasse. What will be our decision? What happened to the three worthies, the friends of Daniel, that refused to bow down to the image? They were thrown into the fire. What's the promise? God will take care of it. Do we have enough faith? Do we have enough faith? Revelation twelve seventeen and the dragon was wrath with the woman. This is now not his woman. This is the woman in white. This is the church that follows God. Now look at the attributes. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now what are the attributes? Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So if you choose to keep God's commandments, you will come up against the state. Even in the other nine, as we saw. But when this one comes into effect, and it will, universally, then there will be a choice, not between the day only, but between whose authority do I accept in my life. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin, unto death, or of obedience, unto righteousness. May God help us to understand these issues and to mull it over in our mind. And if you want to know how this kingdom, this earthly kingdom, will be put together and on what principles it will be based, then I suggest you don't miss tomorrow night because tomorrow night is a humdinger where I show you the exact structure of this kingdom that they're building on earth, which is totally under the control of the first beast, and how it is in every aspect of our lives without us even knowing it. And we're very, very close to the final fulfillment of these prophetic words in the book of Revelation. I hope I see you tomorrow night. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.